Now let us turn our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 23 as we continue in 1 Samuel chapter 23. 1 Samuel chapter 23. Now look at verse 9. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said, to Abiathar, the priest, bring hither the ephod. David knew that Saul was continuing and continuously seeking to hunt him down, plotting and planning to take his life. Now, David has been going through, as we've seen, um, a time where he was, well, greatly appreciated even um, lifted up in Israel as all oh, the slayer of Goliath, the giant for Israel. Now, very soon, he, is, he turned into, well, in the eyes of the nation, well, a hunted dog by the king, Saul, who wanted to retain his throne. David's life was a life of obedience. David was simply wanting to do God's will. Now, why are all these things happening to him? Now, as we go through life, we can be also discouraged. As we live for God, as we become a Christian and walk the life of a Christian, now we can find that there'll be questions in our mind. Why are all these difficulties happening in our lives? And we become easily discouraged. Now, the title today is, well, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Let us consider what are the things that can discourage us as we see in David's life and then also to ask ourselves now, how should I respond? What are, why are these things like that? How should I think in order not to be discouraged? We know that in life there will be problems, right? God says so, that life will be full of difficulties, challenges as we live on earth. Now, first and foremost, one of the things that can discourage us, so we'll, let's look at now how we can be discouraged. One of the things, one of the things is that we can be, well, not of our own fault, be targeted for persecution, for bullying, all right, for, um, for troubles, targeted by people like David. Now, David has not done anything evil or wicked, towards King Saul. He's only been faithful, loyal, even risked his life to fight when King Saul commands him. Why has he done that deserve this hunting of King Saul, targeted by King Saul? Nothing, nothing evil, simply because King Saul was envious of David, jealous of David, simply because of that he once to go hunt down and kill and remove David. Now, sometimes in life, we may face such situations. In a workplace, for example, it's easy to be discouraged. You are there just to do your job, and you're doing your best. You're even you know, helpful to others. And the very people that you're helpful to can be the people that are envious of you for whatever reason and they target you. They make your life difficult. They say false things about you, right? Like King Saul. Keep saying things that are not true about David, not true at all. And then you continue to, well, be nice, be kind, be helpful. Well, it could be your boss. And you wonder, why does my boss treat me with such um, discrimination? He's so nice to someone else, others who may be lazy. But why targeted me. Why? Now we face these things maybe in school as well, right? Young ones, and you feel discouraged. Why is my teacher treating me like that? I try to be a good child in school, but the teacher just don't like me for whatever reason. Well, sometimes it can be um, among friends. You just find that, well, certain people, they don't like you because they're jealous. Are you discouraged by that? You, before you go to work, you just feel like, I, I really don't feel like going to work today. 
This whole scene is going to repeat itself again and again, and actually it's getting worse at work. It's easy to feel discouraged. It's understandable to feel discouraged. So the king, uh, David, had that in his life, targeted simply because someone else doesn't like him, jealous of him, when something that, he, that, that David has that he doesn't have. Now, another aspect that can easily discourage us is, well, increasing troubles because we obey God, because we do His will. Very often, young Christians say, you know, Pastor, I don't understand before I was a Christian, I, life was peaceful. But the moment I became a Christian, well, you know, my family members turn against me. When I go to school, people mock me for believing in something invisible. And as I well understand that I must not um, do this or do that, I, I, I know I should not cheat in school anymore, I should not lie. And when I live such a life, they, 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 they feel that I am being, um, I'm, I'm actually sabotaging them, right? Maybe at work as well. The more you find that when you want to obey God, you find that troubles increase for obedience. Maybe you re realize this is how I need to live as a father, as a mother, as a single. Then you embark on that life and then suddenly you feel well, more difficulties arise because you want to obey God. Financially, it's more difficult. Well, to, then you find that energy-wise, it's more difficult. You find that in obeying God, it becomes more difficult. Now, look at chapter 22, verse 5. And the prophet, chapter 22, verse 5. And the prophet God said unto David, Abide not in the hole, depart and get thee into the land of Judah. That was God's command. And David departed and came into the forest of Hareth. David obeyed God. He was in safety. But God says, go there. And he went there. And what happened when he went there? Look at chapter 23. Well, now he's near Keilah. Because he obeyed God, he went there, he's near Keilah. And then, you find that the, well, the Philistines were attacking Keilah. And because he's near, well, because he obeyed God, he went there. Now suddenly, life becomes more complicated. He had people to look after, 500 men. He had his own troubles. But he said, God wants me to be there, I'll just go. But now when I go there, I realize that suddenly there are people that I need to go and help. Even more troubles come upon me because I obeyed God. Sometimes you obey God and you say, I should not be in this or I should be in that. And then you obey and then when you're in that situation, you find, hey, hang on, there are even more troubles now that I need to attend to. That suddenly becomes my problem. And God says, now go and help Kayla. Well, to obey God, now he has to risk his own life to deliver the people of Kayla. And he has to convince the, the 500 men who were afraid to go with him. David can't go and fight the Philistines alone. He tried to mobilize them and say, David, why, why do you want to do that? We have enough problems for ourselves. But to obey God, he will bring a lot of this upon himself, even carrying the load of people who may be unwilling to go. Christian, when you begin to obey God, you may wonder, well, it was a lot easier before that. You can get discouraged as you do his will. Things turn out tougher for you. And sometimes you may look at others. You know, they disobey God. They don't live according to God's commandments. They don't have to make sacrifices. They don't have to go through difficulties. You begin to wonder, why is it then when I obey God, certain things become more difficult when I do them, when I know I must take on something? We can be discouraged. We can even succumb to the temptation, maybe it's better not to obey God. We get discouraged. Now, what else did David face? Look at chapter 22. 22. Now, verse 1. Verse 1, we know. Well, he had to take care of his father, his father's house, because he's afraid that King Saul will kill them. So now he has this trouble of bringing kings, um, the, the family to find safety for the family. Now then, 
Look at verse 4. Then he had to bring them before the king of Moab, look for another a place for them to stay. He, he had so much on his hands. And then chapter 23, verse 3. Then now he had people, right? In the midst of all this, he had people to say, David, you know, I don't think we should go and do this. Now David began to face one problem after another. You know the world has a saying, it never rains, it pours. <laughs> it never rains, it pours. <laughs> Now, what does it mean? What do they mean? They basically mean misfortunes and difficult situations tend to follow each other, right? If you face, in the world, they think bad luck, right? There's no such thing as bad luck in the Christian life. You know that. No such thing, actually, for anyone. They say, oh, oh bad luck. And then, oh, difficult situations. They say, well, they don't you know, slowly, like, happen. Or if we separate, oh, they just come one after another. Before one, you can solve one thing, the other thing comes, in rapid succession, arriving all at the same time. So that is what it means. Now, sometimes in life, we find, like David, you're in the middle of maybe a financial situation, a difficulty, or maybe a health situation. And then you find that family problems begin to happen. And then you find that, well, more health problem of another family member occurs. And you find that, well, children are difficult, fall sick or whatever. Then you find that things just get worse and worse. In the midst of all that, then the project at work explodes, right? Explodes in a bad way, right? Um, and then you have difficult boss. You say, why? Boss changes, and then suddenly this new boss is a bad boss. You say, why, why, why all these things rapidly one after another? You can get discouraged. Are you in that situation? Now, when we sometimes even not about whether it's about obeying God or not, right? It's just happening and happening. But I want to say, please, as you have learned, don't live in delusion, right? When you find that all these things are happening, examine your own life. Don't live in the delusion that, well, life is like that. I don't want to belabor that point. We've studied that, but examine yourself. But when it is not, you know, in your heart, you're simply walking according to God's will, following His ways, but you find that, oh, all these things are just exploding around you. In the perfect storm, some say. It can get you discouraged. Then another thing that we see in David's life, look at chapter 23, verse 5. Chapter 23, verse 5. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Right? David risked his life. He is having so much problems. And yet he still obeyed God and went to help the inhabitants of Keilah and save them. Please don't think this is an easy thing, all right? Just leading 500 men, going to fight against the Philistines. Now then, look at verse 23, verse 11. Now David asked God when he knew that King Saul was going to pursue him. David asked God in verse 11, Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant have heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Well, there's one thing. Saul kind of expected he will come down. But look at verse 12. And David said, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver thee up. Betrayal. Ungratefulness. Can you even begin to imagine how David feels? I have my life full of problems. My hands are full. I have 500 men who are not willing to go with me to save these inhabitants of Keilah who are in trouble. But yet, I persuaded them. But yet, we went and risked our lives for that. And here... God says, yes, they, yes, King Saul will come down. God knows the heart of men. God knows what men will do before men does it. God knows the heart of men. And to hear the answer is yes. The men of Kelea, they will deliver you. They will hand you over. Means probably they'll capture him, tie him up, and say they will hand you over to King Saul. Can you imagine the kind of discouragement 
Maybe even when he had to tell the people, look, you know, God has told me that the people of Kela will betray us. I began to imagine, you know, the famous, I told you so. <laughs> I can imagine some of them. I told you, right, David? Why do you want to do that? Now we are in trouble with you as well. They'll be blaming him. Why were you so stupid to do that? So you have to face all this. It will be very easy to be discouraged. Betrayals, ungratefulness. You seek to be kind, helpful, and gracious, do what is best for others, and they turn against you. Or maybe when you serve in church, right? You labor, you stay up late at night, you plan, you execute, you serve, taking things upon yourself, and then you hear people complain and murmur, ungrateful, unthankful, right? When things are not what they seem to like, we can get discouraged. Why? You know, I take on all these things upon myself. I have work problems, I have family challenges, but yet I take on service to serve the Lord, to make things happen for people in church. And yet, all I get is complaining and murmuring. Now, we are at a stage of church where I'm very thankful. By and large, people are not like that, all right? At church camp, in fact, um, I was talking to some people about, well, did they sleep well, you know? And they said, oh, um, not so well because, well, the air conditioner the, the, it was leaking and then, you know, we couldn't turn it on, so it was quite cold, we couldn't turn it on, and, and so on. I said, well, you know, I began to think in my heart. I said, why, why didn't you, well, let us know and then we have to get someone or you get someone to fix it. I said, oh, it's all right, it's all right, you know? So people are appreciative. No one said, you know, we paid money to come, you know, and this is not working. Sujin! Where are you? <laughs> right? Well, in, in this case, I say, well, you need to fix it because if you don't sleep well, it's going to affect your concentration, right? This is not a complaint, right? This is trying to um, ensure that you are comfortable so that you can be awake and alert for the messages. Well, by and large, people are very thankful, they are appreciative, they are careful. Um, but what if one day as you serve, right? you find that it is not so. Will you be discouraged? It's easy to be discouraged. I think this last one is really the, mo the most difficult to swallow, right? Maybe some parents, you understand that. So you see, all these things in life can make us easily discouraged. And even as I'm speaking, I don't know how the teens feel because maybe you don't feel, you don't go through all these things. Life is so sheltered by your parents. They care for you. They, they handle all these things for you. Um, you, you, you don't get to eat at a certain time. You think that's like end of the world, that kind of thing. That, that's your biggest problem, and you get <laughs> discouraged. There are a lot of things that your parents shield you from. Maybe some of you do face this. Right? Those of you who are going through these things, you know it's easy to be discouraged. Um, now, then we come to the second point. Now, why... Should we not be discouraged? How should we think in order not to be discouraged? Look at verse 13 and 14. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah, and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul, and David was escaped from Keilah, and he forbear to go forth. So David managed to escape, all right? Now look at verse 14. And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. But God delivered not into him into his hand. Don't be discouraged because no matter what you are going through, like David, right? The four kinds of very difficult situation, you may have your own combination, well, God will help you. Let God help David. God will not allow David to be delivered into King Saul's hand. David was obeying God as long as you're obeying and doing God's will. David simply obeyed God's commandment. Go here, go there, do this, do that. He simply obeyed. Now, as long as you're living such a life, you have no cause for worry or for fear. God will 
help you. Don't be discouraged. Because discouragement will cause you to want to give up, to compromise, and so on. God will ensure David's safety. Opposite to what King Saul thought. Now, if you look in verse, um, verse uh, 6, all right? Oh, sorry, no. Earlier on. Now, David, King Saul actually said, well, God has delivered, God has delivered David into my hand. Now, how delusional that can be. God has delivered, in verse 7, he said, and Saul said, God had delivered him into my hand. No, God delivers David out of King Saul's hand. People may think that, well, they got you, and so on. You may even feel that way. David felt that way. I'm cornered. The city of all the places, God, you led me to has fortified walls and um, strong iron bars. God, I am, I am cornered. David can feel that way. You can feel in your life. So discouraged. God, I try at work and I need the job and I go and it's like that every day. Or maybe some, some situations where health, financial problems all coming at one go. God, I'm trying but I'm so discouraged. I, f I feel cornered. David probably felt that way. Oh, but he just simply went on. He did not allow himself to be discouraged. Now, David can simply say, let me join the enemies and fight Saul instead. Maybe there's a better life, right? You can compromise, say, ah, maybe I just join them in their ways. Now, the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, let me read to you, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer, suffer persecution. But when God says that, God is not saying you're on your own. God is simply telling, expect that, but I will help you. I will be there. I will never leave you or forsake you. If like David, you're walking according to his will and obeying God's commandment, I will be there. Now, perhaps you are not a believer yet. And you wonder, well, yes, my life has many problems. How can I have this promise of this creator of the universe, the almighty God, to have this assurance, God will deliver me. God will help me. I mean, I can't see how. I don't know how. But God can deliver me, help me. Well, there is a deliverance that you sorely need above all else, and that's the deliverance of your soul. Sin will be judged by God, and all of us are sinners. And the eternal judgment of sin is eternal, um, being consigned eternally to hell, the lake of fire. Eternal torment, horror, pain that you can never, ever escape or get out of. It's not just a horrible nightmare. It's a reality that will last forever. That's the deliverance that is most important. Well, Jesus Christ died for your sins. Jesus Christ died, came to die for sins, to deliver men, to save men. Would you receive this payment? Or you say, no, I reject this payment. Turn to him today. I'm a sinner. Tell him, I need your forgiveness. I need you to cleanse me of all my sins, save me today. That is the deliverance that you first and foremost need. Then when He is your God and your Saviour, and you walk according to His ways, He's your heavenly Father. He will help you. He will deliver you for His purposes. So why would you turn away from such a thing? I'm so discouraged, and yet you do not want this important solution for your life. Well, for the believers... Know this. Yes, life will be difficult. Like Christ says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 36, and a man's foe shall be there of his own household. Those closest to you very often will make life the most difficult because you're a Christian. Very often to take a stand, those closest to you will often be the one that you're most afraid to offend, most unwilling to offend. But you know you must live in obedience to God. 
He said, why all this discouragement? God will help you. Please remember that. Don't be discouraged. You may not see it. You may not feel it. Now, very often that we are discouraged because of how we choose to think. Now the question is, um, why does God help you? Why should I feel that through all these difficulties and that I'm facing, I can be assured that if I'm walking to, according to God's will, obeying His commandments, God will help me. Why do you think so? Now, if you understand why God allows these things, why these things happen in your life, if you understand that, you won't be discouraged. So now we ask, why will God help me and, not, and uh, will not be discouraged? Why don't God work this way? Maybe you ask. Now, why don't God just prevent problems from happening in my life? He's God. He's all-powerful. The heart of man is in his hand. Right? We've seen how he can control Saul's heart. Why does not God just control Saul's heart like he did in the beginning and keep him away from David? Why does God not simply let me have an easier life? When if I, in the first place, have an easier life without all these problems, without all this discouragement, I, I, I don't need to be discouraged in the first place and God doesn't need to help me in the first place and God does not need to try and encourage me. Why don't God work this way? Why don't God just do all this prevention and all that so in the very first place, I don't even need to be discouraged? Why not work like that in my life? When he can stop all these things, why does he let it? Now, you see, the thing is this. We look at all these challenges in life, difficulties in life, and we get discouraged because we have a failure to understand why God does it. Now, can you please turn with me to James chapter 1? James chapter 1. You want to not be discouraged? This is something that you have to understand. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Now, allow me to read verses 2 to 4. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, here is God revealing to man why, though the Almighty God can stop all these things, He does not. Now look at James chapter 1. Diverse temptations, this word diverse means all shapes and forms, all colors, and multitude and myriad of them. All right? All sorts. All sorts. Now God says, come to all joy. Wait, God, I am discouraged. Joy is the opposite of discouragement. But God, you told me, you tell me to, well, not be discouraged. Not only that, but to count it all joy. It is my joy. When I face, well, more than the four kinds of discouragement in my life that, I've, that, that we've mentioned. Now, he explains why. Look at verse, verse 3. Knowing this. Now, you need to know something about things that you view as discouragement. You need to know this. The try, that the trying of your faith, the testing, the pushing, the developing of your faith worketh patience. God allows these things. In fact, God may even design these things into your life because it's supposed to work something. Now, this word work, all right, this word work, that means to actually accomplish something to the fullest. It means to bring about. It is intentional. It, is, it comes with a design to bring to fruition something. So God is causing this to fashion and to perform something in your life to accomplish something fully. 
You see, we see things that happen in our life as discouragements. God tells us to know this. They are designed to work something. And it's about your faith. The trying of your faith. Works patience. Patience to be, and then let patience have a perfect work. Go through it. And look at the ultimate purpose in verse 4. That ye may be, know this, that ye may be perfect. Means mature, entire, complete, and wanting nothing, nothing lacking in your life. Not weak in this area, in that area. Now, when the Christian begins to understand this, you must know, God designs things into your life. You are discouraged because you do not know that God is actually doing something to develop and strengthen you. And that is why you get discouraged. Discouragement is from your flesh and from Satan. Satan wants you to think the very opposite of what God is doing in your life. And the very opposite thing of God doesn't love you. God doesn't care. God cannot help you. God doesn't know. God is not interested in your life. So you get discouraged. Now David was, in David's case for example, David has already been chosen by God to be the king of Israel. Saul has failed and failed miserably. So God has already chosen David. But in order for David, one day when he becomes king and sits on the throne, David must be developed. David must be trained. If not, David will fail. David will fall. There are different aspects of David's life, David's life that must be strengthened. He must go through all this. Israel is not simply going to be a physical nation. He's not going to rule a nation just for the, for the, for the physical aspects of things. But it is needed. As a king, he needs to organize. He needs to lead. Right? He needs to um, um, bring people forth to defend the country and so on. So he needs to be trained in all these organizational skills and so on. So God is allowing this pursuit, these, these battles, they're all part of David's training. But David can be discouraged if he doesn't see it that way. But it is not just a physical nation. It's, it's meant to be a spiritual nation. That is first and foremost. So David's faith must be trained. The trying of your faith, right? the testing. Now, this testing is not about, let me see. Uh, David, I don't really know about your faith, right? Let me, let, let me find out by testing you. It's not that, mean, that, that meaning of testing. Now, it, is mean, it means to actually push you, to push you to a further limit. To make you learn. Students, do you like tests? Right? It's a bad word, right? Test. I don't hear test or oh, you are going into a panic. Test. Test is coming. I don't know about you. I mean, I was a student. I don't hear the word test. It's like, <laughs> test is scary. It's, it's stressful. It's painful. Why do you think school design tests for you? I know you say, well, to, to torture us. They don't like us, right? To make my life miserable. Well, but if you think about it, you understand. They want you to study. Because when there's no test, you won't study. They want you to prepare. They want you to go through that. They want you to know. They want you to know what you don't know, all right? They don't need to test you for their, for their benefit. It's for your benefit. So that when you, as you prepare, as you go through, then you say, now I remember, now I know, all right? Then it sticks in you. That's the test. David need to be tested. David need to know his own weaknesses. David need to know his own faith. That is why in the beginning, David failed, all right? He panicked. He feared. And he went to the enemy king, Achish, to ask for help. And then he had to commit sin when he knew he was in trouble. Then David learned. From there on, you see, David prays, David obeys God, David trusts in God. Go there, David, but God is dangerous there. David just went. His faith grew, testing. 
Now, every aspect of David's life must be developed. Yes, God can change King Saul's heart. God can stop King Saul um, um, dead in the tracks, kill him, remove him from this earth. Nothing can prevent God from doing anything to make David's life easier. But here, God must make sure that David would be ready when he sits on the throne. He must be courageous. He must not fear. So he will have to go through many fears, many pursuits, many persecutions. And yet he will always see God delivering him. Then by the time he has to lead the country, he will remember the lessons. It's the same for your life. But David must also be holy. That no matter what happens, as we see later on, David will not sin against God. He must learn that. That pressed in trials, pressed in difficulties, will David sin? He learn not to sin. Now, Christian, like I mentioned earlier on, we are discouraged because we choose to think about the situation as something as evil and bad. That is why we get discouraged. Once you begin to understand God's purposes, let me read just, for example, Romans 5, 3 to 4. Romans 5, 3 to 4. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulations worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. Now, it's very consistent in scriptures. Repeatedly, God tries to reveal to you tribulations, trials, difficulties are designed by God to work. Again, that word, work. To bring out, to cultivate, to strengthen, to accomplish, to bring to fruition, to bring to completion even. To work something in you. And he say, well, patience, then patience, experience, then experience, hope. Now, all sorts of aspects of your life must go through these things. It's God does not design it to cause you to be discouraged. God designed it to help you grow. But Satan, in his, Satan will design things to discourage you, to make you think that these are things that God does to torture you. Right, students? What a test for to torture us, to make our lives miserable. No. I don't know, maybe some teachers do that. I don't know. <laughs> All right? But, now I give you the example which I kind of alluded to during church camp. If you want to be fit and you want to grow muscles, you know where this is going. You find a trainer. Then the trainer will well, start with certain weight, right? maybe 5 kilograms, 10 kilograms. Then the only way, the only way, and you know that, for you to grow stronger after some time, the only way is not to keep repeating doing what you're doing. The only way is for the trainer to increase the weights. Now let's do 12. Now let's do 15 kilograms, all right? The only way you know in your heart, the only way for the muscles to grow is the increase of loading. But it's unpleasant. But because you know the only way for me to grow is increasing weight, you think differently. Do you go that very discouraged? I am so discouraged, you know. No, you say bring it on. Because you know. In fact, you're very happy. Looks like Today, he's going to increase weight. This means I've reached a certain stage and now I can grow further. Which is why God says, count it all joy. Count it as a glory. That God says that now you are ready. So the more troubles you have, as long as it's not because of sin, God is saying you are ready for the next growth. And you also know there is no way you can possibly grow a different part of your body's muscle by keep doing the same thing. The trainer, in order to develop another part of your body, well, he will ask you to do a new exercise. Completely not, not done before and now it's a new experience. Like David, he has all different kinds of experience in his life. Now you begin to see every part is being developed 
every part of David's well need to be able to do things physically, need to be able to grow spiritually. Every part was being developed. Not every part was being well tortured. You do not go to the gymnasium with the aim to grow and then say, no, I don't want this, I don't want that. You don't tell the gymnase, gymnasium um, when, 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 the, when the trainer says, well, don't be discouraged. Right? You don't say, why don't you not increase weight in the first place, then I won't be discouraged. You don't say that. Why? Because you know, which is why God says, know this, knowing this, that the trying of your faith, knowing this, this must be forefront in our minds, otherwise you will be discouraged. So from the arm, now the leg. A different, totally different kind of trial, right? Testing. He will push you, push you, push you, right? But even, if, even trainers, they know how much they can push you. Now God promises in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to men. Maybe turn there, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to men. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which ye are able, but will with, will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Now, God knows how much testing, pushing you can take. God knows your heart. Just like God knows that where the King Saul will go, God knows better than you yourself. And God promises, number one, there's no temptation taken you but such as common to men. Don't look at difficulties in your life and keep saying, and wallow in self-pity and keep saying, you know, you don't know. My problems are not like anyone else's problem. The difficulties I have with my child, with my home, with my job, with my um, uh, um, in-laws, with my friends, whatever it is, with my spouse, you, you don't understand. There's nothing like this. But God says there has no, zero, zero temptation, zero kind of trials. Please understand, when God is doing the temptation, the Greek word, all right, is the same word, temptation, uh, as in a bad kind of temptation, or temptation simply to mean testing, all right, pushing. When God does that, it's testing, pushing. It's meant for your good. No temptation have taken you, but such as common to man. Why do we get discouraged? Because we keep thinking, this is different, right? You go to the gym, What? 15 kilogram. Everybody has gone through that. They say, there's no such thing. We say, no, we, this is how we put people through the regime. But if you want to keep insisting, this is too much, this is special. Well, then the trainer said, but I know you can go to the next stage, but you refuse, right? Well, God is far more faithful. God is far more omniscient and wise. God says, I know what you can take. You can so when you're going through that, God, why, why, why is everyone else's life so easy? Why is mine like that? Why is my child, my spouse, my boss, my work, my health, why is it like that? Just know this. God knows what you can take. That is why He allows it. Why all at one go? God knows how much you can take. Look at it as something good. So when you are with the trainer, you say, now you, you do your, your, your weight, your upper body, and at the same time, do your lower body press, bench presses as well, whatever is the term, right? Forgive me if I said it wrongly. Now, your, your, your leg muscles as well. All at the same time, I know you can now. You're ready for that now, right? You don't ask that. You say, bring it on because you know, wow, this is great. Now, the other part is coming. Money worth it. <laughs> I'm going to get more. You see, how you think affects 
whether you get discouraged once you understand it. Now, furthermore, he says, he won't allow you to be tempted above that which you are able. But with temptation shall also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. As long as you are in that situation and God has not delivered, it, delivered you, lightened the situation, God is saying this, you can bear it. And when he knows you cannot, he will, like David, provide a way of escape. It's time for you, David, to escape. He will. So as long as you're in that situation, don't murmur, don't complain. Just know it's possible. God knows how much you can take. And God knows the only way to increase your spiritual strength, your experiential faith, your convictions, the only way is to increase the load and sometimes bring different situations at the same time. Because in that combination, now your faith becomes stronger. So every part needs to be tested. Every part needs to be growing. Now, when you think about this, once you understand this is how God works, and these are not the only verses, all right? Turn to first, well, you know this, First Peter chapter 5, verse 10. But the God of all grace, who have called us unto the eternal glory of Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, made you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. After, he have, after ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. This is how God works. You will see this repeatedly in scriptures. So Christian, you must know Unless you see this clearly, you will be discouraged. You will not want to go to work. You will not want to go to school. You will not want to face the day because you see them as bad, evil, discouraging. You will not want to go to the gym, right? But when you see this is for growth, instead of discouragement, the opposite will happen. That's joy. I say again, bring it on. I want to be pushed. I want to be tested. Once you begin to understand it's for your faith to grow, your spiritual strength to increase, and it's God working out a plan, right? Do you want to go to a gym, gym trainer who has no plan for you? Gym trainer, what's the plan? Well, we, we, we'll go along and see what I feel like. You'll be very worried, right? There's a plan. He will observe that at this stage, what's next, what's next, what's next, which part? You say, wow, I think I'll sign up with this guy, all right? There's a plan. God has a plan. Please know. Don't look at this as, oh, this, all this kind of discouragement. No, God has all this kind of development, not discouragement. Remember that. Know this. God intends to develop. Satan intends to discourage while God is developing, the very thing that God uses to strengthen, Satan will turn it into something that you should look at it as a discouragement. That is how he works. Why? Because he does not want you to grow. Once you grow, you are useful to God. Once you grow, you will be a good witness for God. Satan does not want you to grow. So discouragement is something that the Christian must understand. God is developing, but my flesh and Satan will fan your flesh. Satan say, this is discouragement. This is discouraging. So discouraging, I serve, and then people are not happy. No, God is testing you. God has to develop, develop David's heart, that even when Keilah will deliver him and his people to, to, um, to King Saul, Satan, David will not be discouraged. Jesus says, God, what's going to happen? Okay, then I'll move on. S David has to experience that as a king because as a leader, very often, people will turn against you. Even you meant it for their good. They will not appreciate it. They will, they will do things to discourage you. Say, David has to go through all that, part of his development. I say again, God can remove all these things just with a thought. Why did he leave it in David's life? To discourage, to discourage David? We read and say, oh, poor David. No, to develop, 
David. Now, we move to the last point, all right? First and foremost, don't be discouraged because God will help you. Don't be discouraged because that is God's development plan for you. And thirdly, because it's God's way of preparing you for greater usefulness. Greater usefulness. Not just to build you up, but to prepare you for greater usefulness. Now, David was slated to be king. David will have to do a lot of things. He would be the first real good king of Israel. He has to set the example, the tone for all future kings. David has a great task on his shoulders. The first real king that was God's choice. King Saul was given because of the people who wanted a king before God's timing, before God's choice. David was not even born yet. But the people insisted, so God let them have it to teach them a lesson. David was the choice of God, and David was going to be slated for great work. Now, don't, don't let it be going to your mind to become proud. Well, the more God puts, on, puts loads on me, then he has great things and glory for me. Right? The moment we think like that, we are not ready for great things. Now, if you want God to use you more, you want, you want to be a better testimony for God. You want to be a parent, a father, a mother, that will really inspire your child to want to live as Christ walked. You want to be such a Christian to others. You want to be useful to God, not for pride, eh? please remember. Then you must be ready for more trials, more pushing. So the gym instructor will look. All right, say, well, who are among the people in the gymnasium? They are serious. They look at difficult regimes that I design into their life as something positive, as something that they look forward to, as something that they see and they realize in their heart, I'm trying to help them develop every part of their body. Which are the ones? And they say, ah, these are the ones that I'll send, send out for competition with another gymnasium. Is there such a thing? Uh, just for example. Right? Well, well, we have competitions between the gymnasium who has the fittest, um, uh, the most, um, have the strongest endurance, uh, that kind of thing. Well, in school, you have these kind of things, right? He will look and say, which are the ones? Are these other ones? Use them. In the workplace, it's the same, right? Maybe a workplace is more realistic. Who are the ones that we will send forth to take on greater challenges for the company? Um, more important businesses. They look. The ones that keep complaining and moaning about workload, now, I'm not saying unless it's unreasonable. Right? Just want an easy cruising life? Do you think your boss picked those people? But people who, who love the challenge, who does things for the sake of the company, right? who are not afraid of a challenge, and they find that this is what helped them to develop. You choose those for higher, bigger tasks. So when you begin to understand God would bring David through this kind of challenges. God did not bring King Saul through that. King Saul was written off very soon. But God would let David to go through all this, would lead David to go through all this for many, many more years. How do you like that? For many, many more years. Increasingly more difficult situations because God was making the regime more stringent increasing the load, making challenges tougher for David because David is going to step on a higher plane. Christian, we sing. We want to walk on a higher plane, right? Then understand and think of all these things in this perspective. Know this is what God says. Turn to Romans 8, 28. All right, and be close. Romans 8, 28. Now, our theme is about walking as Christ walked. You come back fired up. I want to walk as Christ, my Savior, walked. Romans 8, um, 
Romans 8, 28. Now, God, God's Word says, and we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. So now you begin to understand this passage. All things means all things. All things means even the things that look discouraging to you. Replace the word discouraging now as developing. And say all things work together for good. But do you know why God allow all these things in your life? Now look at verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. To be conformed to the image of his son. Everything that God brings into this life of yours is not to, is not to um, discourage you. It's to actually conform you, to make you closer in your walk as his son. As his son. You say, I want to walk as Christ walked then these are things that God will begin to do in your life. Don't look at them as something that is evil, unnecessary. God, why don't you not have anything of this sort in my life? Now, in closing, well, yesterday I preached about, well, the transformation of a Christian. The word is metamorphosis, metamorphosis. And very often people use this um, analogy, I don't know how accurate it is, but it seemed to be. They say in the final stage of the pupa coming out as an adult butterfly, a beautiful one, this forming of the cocoon around it, and to come out of the cocoon, it has to struggle. It has to push its way, to force its wings outwards to break the cocoon, right? To come out of it. And when it come out, then it will spread its wings and you will see the beauty of and the strength of the butterfly. All right? Well, someone says, you know, if you actually cut and say, oh, the poor butterfly is struggling, let's not let it go through all this trouble. Let's make it easier. If you slice open the cocoon and let it just come out like that, it did not go through the, 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 the pushing, the blood um, did not go, go to the vessels. And when it come out, it will just be flopping around. Weak, no beauty. I think biologically it's quite true. Maybe it's not, I don't know. But I think it's a good analogy. Unless you go through the exercising, the testing, the proving, the forcing, that you feel the pressure, the difficulty, or you will not grow to that stage of usefulness, beauty, that God intend for you to reflect Him. Now let us rise to sing the closing hymn. Now let us sing um, 325 instead, all right? 325. Shall we rise? 325. All things work for our good. 325.